recording. Hey, hey everyone, Lee Ashby here for BSMA Motocross Memories. I've got another classic interview for you tonight. I have got former AMA star and pro circuit Kawasaki rider, David Pingree. How are you doing, David? Real good. Thanks for having me on. It's awesome to get you on, mate. Absolute pleasure to be able to get you on. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, you bet. Top man. Uh, so we'll crack on with the questions then. Uh, what was your favourite track as a schoolboy rider, and then your pro, uh, pro career as well, and why? Um, I think as an amateur, there, you know, um, my favourite was always Mammoth Mountain. I don't know how familiar you are with that over here, but yeah, uh, yeah. yeah it's a one-time-a-year event. Maybe that's what makes it so cool, uh, is you don't get to ride it often. Okay. Uh, but it also has incredible dirt. You're up in the mountains, you know, in this beautiful town, and there's mountain biking and fishing and hiking. And so the race was awesome, always awesome, but just being up there was great. That was always my favorite amateur event. Still is if I can get up there for – they have a whole vet week. And so I still try to make that as often as I can. Um, as far as my favorite pro track, um, You know, it's, I mean, probably one of my favorite tracks was Millville Oh yeah. Uh, in Minnesota. Uh, I, I always did crappy there. I, was, I did terrible. I, I don't even know that I ever got into the top five overall, but um, just great dirt. And again, great location, um, fun layout. So. Okay, cool. Um, what, what riders did you look up to and idolize when you were young and why? Yeah, Wardy was my guy, Jeff Ward. Jeff Ward, Jeff Ward, yeah. Yeah, you know, and back then, I, I mean, I was born in 75, so um, we didn't, <laughs> there wasn't really, I didn't know anything about Grand Prix motocross or, oh, right, okay. uh, you'd read it in the cycle news, yeah. you know, weeks and weeks after the event, that was the best you could do. So uh, I, w I rode Kawasaki's when I was a kid, I've always been short, so Wardy was like my guy. <laughs> um, and I liked that he was, <clears throat> he was a fierce competitor and he always just let his, his riding do the talking, you know. Yeah. Uh, when I was a kid, I actually used to not like Rick Johnson. <laughs> yeah. You know, they were kind of nemesis at the time. Yeah, that yeah, was yeah. when I really started watching the sport. It was when Wardy and RJ and Bailey and Johnny O, you know, those guys were all really fighting. Yeah. And um, yeah. I, RJ is a friend of mine now. I, he's amazing. And I really appreciate the way he, he was yeah. now. But at the time, he pissed yeah. me off because he would always just run his mouth. And, you know, Wardy was just like – professional and just got got the job done you know? <laughs> so i appreciated that as a kid um yeah. and then gosh really until um it was really just wardy was my guy until i got a, i moved from montana where i was born to arizona and uh i got to be friends with jimmy button because he was he lived in that same area and so i was i was uh starting to get better on mini bikes and going to amateur nationals and doing better I was riding with Jimmy quite a bit and hanging out with him. So he was a big influence on me as well. Just, just, uh, riding technique and, and race strategy and all that kind of stuff. He helped me a lot. So did you, did you actually, did you actually get to ride or race with any of your guys that you looked up to? Well, um, yeah, I mean, so when I, not obviously during my motocross career, well, I did Jimmy, yeah. but, um, the neat, the coolest thing was when I got into supermoto racing yeah. after I was done with my career, Wardy was the 450 guy at TLD Honda, and I they hired me to be the 250 guy. So I got to travel around and race with, and then I eventually moved up to the 450 class and raced with him, and we competed at X Games and things like that. So, um, and again, now Wardy's become a good friend of mine, and uh, some of my best memories are he and I, you know, the very first race transporter that TLD had was a piece of junk. It was an old NASCAR truck. <laughs> Didn't have any AC. It was set up terribly. It was awful. It was cracking in half, literally. <laughs> yeah. But we'd sit in the front lounge area, which was where we would just get dressed because it was just the setup was all screwed up. And there's no AC, so we'd be at these hot races, you know, both of us not in the physical shape we used to be in our primes. A little chubby, kind of sweating up there, trying to pull on these leather pants, you know, and we would just start <laughs> laughing like, dude, what are we doing? Uh, but to have those memories of, like, just admiring him so much then getting to know him and he is really a genuinely good guy 
Yeah. You know, they say a lot of times you don't want to meet your heroes because they let you down. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah. It wasn't the case at all with him. And, you know, I just have some really fun memories of going racing with Jeff. So that's amazing uh, memories then. Yeah, for sure. So, so lucky. That's pretty cool. That's, that's really cool. Um, who were your closest rivals in your pro racing days? And who did you enjoy racing with the most and why? Oh, um, in my pro days, let's see. Well, you know, each year it was different. Um, as, as I, as I kind of went into the pro ranks, there was Damon Huffman and Craig Decker and Mike Metzger and Casey Johnson. Those would be kind of the guys right as I was transitioning in. And then Craig got hurt. Metz kind of went to freestyle. Huffman was winning everything. Um, and you know, Casey was my teammate at Pro Circuit there in 95, 96. So um, I, I would say, you know, those guys initially, but then it was like every year it would change. You know, in 90, 95, uh, Rhino and Huffman. Rhino was my teammate, Huffman, but they were both kind of beating me. I wouldn't even call them rivals. Yeah. I, was the, I was kind of a rookie and um, trying to just learn from them. And then the following year, Kevin Windham came into the class, and he and I were competing for that championship till I got hurt. Um, 98 was Villeman. Um, 99 was Nathan Ramsey. I mean, it's like every year it was somebody different. 97 was Ricky Carmichael. So kind of every year that, that I raced, it was somebody different. Um, there wasn't any one person that kind of stayed with me my whole career. Yeah, I did have rivalries with Greg Schnell and Brian Deegan that okay. stemmed from Deegan and I got into it at, at an amateur national when we were kids and never liked each other. Okay. And Schnell and I, same thing. Like I was more, I was kind of the anti, I guess I would have been the establishment guy, right? Like I, I had the factory ride. I was clean cut, wore the button up shirt and they had tattoos. They were like, <laughs> You know, screw the establishment. <laughs> we're we're not corporate sellouts. Yeah. So we kind of just we're two separate groups, you know. Yeah, and then yeah. uh, uh, maybe that caused some of the friction. And that's all stupid. We've all squashed it all now. But um, I would say that was kind of the the biggest rivals I had coming up. Okay, that's cool. Um, what were your favorite? What was your favorite race team and bike you rode during your career? Primal Impulse Suzuki. Um, and it would have been 99 and 2000 that I rode for them. Yeah. And there's a few reasons why I, I really like that. One, I had great mechanics, a guy named Todd Brown and a guy named um, Sean Ulikowski. Uh Ulikowski went on to work for Preston when he won his championship, and Todd Brown's still in the industry doing suspension. And we were in a box van. Uh, I, I am such a fan of, of those days. Yeah. You know, there was something, while the presentation looks a lot better in a semi-truck, you know, the current haulers that everybody uses. Yeah, yeah. There was something so, um, it's just so fun about being in a van. It was you and your mechanic. And though, you know, I had several teammates, we were kind of like a team within the team. Yeah. So we would go during the week and find our own places to practice. And we got the same parts from the race team, but then we'd kind of tweak on them and we were trying to always make our bike better. So you kind of had a team within a team and it just, the box that allowed you to, between races, you know, go ride at different tracks and stay at this guy's house and ride his track. And you just had a lot more freedom where now it's like the truck picks up and it's headed to the next place and you got to fly home, you know, Um, very regimented. is it? Yeah. It just doesn't allow for that latitude that we had back then. And Mm -hmm. uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, So those, those, those two years were really good. That bike was the best bike I ever, 125 ever raced. Um, uh, Yeah. At the time, Bill's pipes, those guys were just, they were doing awesome things with factory Honda and they brought that over to the Suzuki and the thing was a missile. I couldn't, I couldn't make that bike do anything wrong. That 2000 RM125 was incredible. And then when they changed in 2001, they went to the new model. It was kind of designed for Pastrana. It was taller and longer. And man, I couldn't, I couldn't ride that thing to save my life. <laughs> so anyway, I, I still, I always kind of keep an eye on Craigslist for an old RM125 from that year, from 2000. Yeah, yeah. One one day I may pick one up. Yeah, that'd be cool, wouldn't it? Okay, next one. What was your favorite race number? Uh, was there any reason for having or wanting it? 
and how did it come about even as a youngster? Well, throughout my whole pro career, um, you, and even still, you know, you get a national number based on the amount of points you've earned, but that's changed a ton. Used to be 125 Supercross didn't count for points. It was 250 Supercross or 125 or 250 Outdoor Nationals or 500s when back when they had those. So yeah. as a result, my, my national numbers were never that low. I had 29 a couple of times, 35, um, 41. But if they were using the current system and you were adding Supercross points, because there was years I was top three in Supercross. I rode some 250 East rounds and I raced the whole national series. I would have been a top, easily inside the top 20, top 15 mm-hmm. number. Yeah. but it wasn't like that back then. So uh, I would say during my pro career, I really like 29. I had it twice, once in 96 and then again in 98. Um, but I, I actually really like the the 101 that I've been using since then. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and the reason I picked that, you know, I get a lot of people that ask me that. And mm-hmm. um, I try to, out of respect for those guys that earn those top 99 numbers, because they bust their ass and it's, it's not easy to earn a national number and i didn't want to have a number that somebody else earned and yeah, so i kind of left those alone and i thought well josh hansen's kind of got a lock on 100 over here yeah. uh so what's the next number 101 all right i'll take it you okay with that that's pretty cool yeah it does look cool as well um right uh for what track stroke venue did you not enjoy racing at and why sacramento uh, Hangtown National, which is now the opener, yeah. just to, it, it's gotten much better. So I don't want to offend those guys. Yeah. Back when I was racing, and go back and look at any photos from the 90s. Yeah, yeah. It was a piece of crap. It would be muddy in the morning, and then turn by by the first by the time the first motos were up, it was hard as a rock. There was blue groove down, and then what they the way they handled the track prep back then, they would flood it for our race. So that it was good for the 250 race. Yeah. So you got this rock hard, shiny, slick base, which I know you guys probably have some tracks yeah, like that. Yeah, there. yeah, Fox Hill, yeah. Now just flood the piss out of it and, <laughs> and go. I mean, it's a nightmare. I, I, yeah, it was yeah. the worst place. Wet on hard is not good. Now they're, they're bringing different kind of soils in and ripping it, and it's better. It's definitely yeah. better. It was a mess back then. <laughs> Doesn't sound good. Right, I've put, what was your favorite racing gear? you've worn during your career and why <laughs> that's an interesting question i mean uh i, I love the tld stuff yeah. that i'm in now um yeah, yeah yeah just i've been friends with troy he's painted my helmet since 95 i've got every helmet he ever painted for me God, and i've been in their gear since 2003 um so I've, I've just got a good relationship with that company but i will say the one thing that stands out my first year of pro racing i wore jt yeah. And uh, as a kid, looking up to, you know, all of those guys from that era, JT was it. I mean, that was that was the coolest stuff you could get, man. So I, I rode for them in, in 92, 93, and 94. And um, it was starting to kind of be not as cool, for sure. It was, it was like these ugly, weird purple colors. And yeah. the designers maybe had been hit on the head a couple few times. But in that year, in 94, they made me some retro stuff. Okay. It was like just the old JT Racing USA logo yeah. uh, with like kind of these old school patches and um yeah anyway uh, did did Ron Machine did Ron Machine the dogger Ron Machine wear that as well didn't he Yeah he did um, I mean he wore it when it was cool and then he he stayed yeah. in it all the way up until they kind of went out of business or went paintball or whatever Yeah yeah so. yeah it's pretty cool I loved the JT as well um, did you have any superstitions or anything you ha- or anything you had to do on race days, or things you had to have a certain way on the day, or anything like. That? <clears throat> yeah, I, I mean, the only thing that I had that was kind of ritualistic was I always put my left sock and knee brace on first. <laughs> but it was because my knees were so screwed up. I I hurt them really young. I mean, '93 I tore my first ACL. I did another one in '95, and another one in '98. And so, and my right knee is still it's really junk. So I would have my knee braces so tight um, that it, it started to hurt after a while. So I would always put it on my left first because I didn't have to do that when it's tight. And the right one, man, I just cinched that thing down. <laughs> so that was really the only thing I did. I mean, 
I think racers are all a little bit superstitious just because, man, you're looking <laughs> for any little thing that'll help. You. But, uh, I wasn't too crazy. I didn't have underwear that I had to wear, any, you know, stupid stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, not too bad. Not too bad, not too bad. Does, uh, it seems to consume quite a few from some of the stuff they go on about. It's like crazy, some of the stuff. Well, I'm telling you, we're a mental case. Racers are just... <laughs> I know. And I, and I really think that the guys who, who really excel, like Stefan or McGrath or Ricky, mm. they're able to somehow just quiet that all of that mm. chatter in your brain down and just, you know, focus in. Yeah. And that's so hard to do. I mean... A lot of riders will have days where they get into that and they don't mm-hmm. let any of the distractions get to them. Mm-hmm. And they'll be like, man, I was, it just came easy to me today. I don't know what happened. Mm-hmm. But to duplicate that and do that every week, week after week, it's really hard. Yeah, yeah. And guys are very good at it. Um, where did you race as a amateur racer and the details of it back then? So like I said, I grew up in Montana. Um which is not a great state to live if you're trying to race motorcycles. It's it's cold, man. It'd be like living up in the northern tip of Norway or something for you guys over there, you know, in that part of the country. I mean, just, yeah, it's, you could ride maybe five or six months out of the year. So, you know, we, we rode our faces off all summer and then uh, parked the bikes, you know, for the wintertime. But when I was 10, I moved down to Arizona, which is a much better area. We can ride all year round. And, um, you know, for those first 12 years, I would say I was just doing local racing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wasn't doing a lot of amateur nationals. We did one, went to the World Mini Grand Prix in Las Vegas one year, okay. uh, right before I moved to Arizona. <clears throat> and I freaked out, man. I'd never seen so many people. I mean, you got <laughs> Montana's like a, it, <laughs> there is no big towns, you know, everybody lives in yeah. just little agricultural communities. It's yeah. wide open. It's beautiful. Yeah. But it. Uh, to go from that to a big stage of motocross and motocross back then in the mid eighties, <clears throat> it was huge over here. There'd be thousands and thousands of people showing up to race. Yeah. You'd have qualifiers, you know, like six or seven groups of qualifiers just to qualify into the main event. Um, so I, yeah, I sucked right early on the first several years I went, I was terrible. I would get so nervous and freaked out by all the people yeah. that I wouldn't I wouldn't ride nearly as good as I was capable of riding. <clears throat> After I was in Arizona for a little bit and again started riding with Jimmy Button and sort of working with him a little bit. Jimmy Gaddis lived there as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um and those guys were so fast, you know. So just even being able to watch them. Yeah. And yeah. see what was possible, you know. Oh, wow, you can really come into this corner that fast or yeah. you can really jump that on an 80, you know. Like I I just wasn't sure when you can see somebody do something, at least for me, it's much easier to duplicate it rather than to just go, well, I, maybe I can do this or, you know, not know what the limits are. So that helped me a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, but we did do um, probably when I was 12, 13, then we started going. We started going over to California. That was when the Golden State Series was still it was still pretty big, not in its heyday of the of the 80s, late 80s. But mm-hmm. we were doing the local Southern California racing. You know, which was a five-hour drive. It wasn't too bad. And you go over there, and it's full gates again of, of really fast guys. Yeah. And so I can't count all the trips we did back and forth to California, man. Just, <laughs> you know, my dad loved it, obviously, like any any other kid. You know, the dad's as involved as you are. Yeah, He's as invested in it and, and yeah. passionate about it as the kid. Yeah. yeah. So we would drive over and just, you know, hit every race we could. And, um we did do Mammoth a few times. We did we did go to Loretta Lynn's a couple times. Um, but, but we really, there was so much competition in Southern California. I didn't have to go too far, too much further than that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, anyway, that was a lot of Southern California stuff. A lot of Glen Helen, Paris Raceway, you know, all those yeah. famous places that are still there. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, do you still ride at all now? And if you do, where and what bikes do you currently have and ride? I do. Uh, I wish I got to ride a little more. I'd say I ride probably three times a month, I guess, if I had to put a number on it. But most of those, because I work for Vital MX, and I do all of their uh, project bikes, and build those up and test them. Yeah. And I do all their new bike introductions and the shootouts and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. uh, I would say most of the time it's it's working on one of those, which is 
it's great because it kind of gives me a reason to go like, oh, I got to go riding today, you know, but it's always on a different bike. And so while I do have a couple of bikes that are projects I built that are, are, are mine, okay. um, I don't get to ride them that much. I mean, I got a brand new YZ125 I've ridden one time <laughs> and it's just built to the nines. It's actually it's the a, same motor Ryan Villapoto raced with last year when he did those 125 all-star oh, races. Yeah, yeah, it's that. the yeah. actual cylinder and head and pipe that he oh, used. So um, he awesome. came right off his bike and went right onto mine. That's a pretty trick then. Yeah, super trick. But I, like I said, I, <laughs> The last, you know, ever since I've gotten it finished, yeah. every yeah, week sure. it's like I've got a new project bike. Oh, I got to go test that bike or ride this one or that one. So I know that sounds like I'm a really stupid thing to complain about, but it's <laughs> nice to ride your own bike and yeah, get, yeah. On get something time, you're comfortable get on. And it's, yeah. it's set up for you, you know. So, <laughs> um, you yeah, I, I don't race too much anymore. Yeah. Just I got two little girls and and three jobs and you know it just doesn't really lend itself to being able to spend a whole day out at the track but i can sneak away for three or four hours and go ride you know and then get home so um i might race once or twice a year just something fun but, uh i still try to ride pretty regularly that's cool um when did you finish competitive racing and why uh 2003 was my last year um so I kind of did the 10 year thing, you know, the first race I did was 93 pro race. And then I finished in the end of 2003 and I just, I was just done. I mean, uh, at that point I was late twenties, which is crazy that it, in the late 20s, at your late twenties, you're like, I'm done. I'm, I can't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I, like I said, I had blown my knees out pretty bad and, um, I don't know if you remember, I, I, you know, I, my career was full of injuries. That was really my biggest downfall was just a lot of injuries. And I had made a really good run in 2002 with the Red Bull KTM team. Um, just got healthy, like had a, you know, a good run of being healthy through all of 2000, 2001. I stayed healthy. So then going into 2002, I was actually riding great. We got that KTM, even though it didn't have a link, we had it working pretty well. It was fast. And I did okay at the first couple rounds. I won the third round, which was uh, Anaheim 2. I was right there in the points. James Stewart was just in front of me, and I was second in points. And that was when we went to Phoenix, where you, I've probably seen where my bike breaks in half. Yeah. That was that weekend. I was leading my heat race, riding great. Everything was awesome. And then disaster. And like just after that happened – it was really hard for me to get my head back in the game. You know, I had, I had had so many injuries to that point and you, you just have to figure out a way to kind of block them out or let enough time go by that you forget about it. Mm -hmm. And that was just like a really blunt reminder that even I could be doing everything right. And this sport is so volatile. It could still, I mean, I, I should have been really jacked up from that crash. And thankfully I wasn't, I did a slight shoulder separation and I was coughing up some blood, which was nothing but, it just sort of was like the last kind of nail in the coffin for me psychologically, where I'm like, man, I'm not, I'm not willing to take these chances anymore. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I rode some nationals that summer, the following year, I, I had an opportunity with, to ride for the Moto World Suzuki team. And I thought, okay, I'll be back to the Bill's pipe Suzuki. I love that bike. I'll give it one last go here and see. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, like I, like I mentioned in 2001, when they changed that bike, it just wasn't the same. And uh, I couldn't yeah. couldn't agree with it. Yeah. Didn't have real good results. Ended up breaking my wrist in Supercross. Struggled through the nationals, and I mean, I knew I knew I was done. Halfway through that season, I'm like, yeah, this isn't gonna this isn't gonna work out. I'm done. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, what other sports do you enjoy watching or doing? Um, you know, I'll tell you, I don't enjoy watching a lot of sports. Yeah. Um, I can't sit still that long, you know, uh, <laughs> and I just, the only thing that I'll watch is my girls playing soccer. They both play okay. soccer competitively or football uh, okay. competitively. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I've gotten into, I mean, I love it. I love watching them play, but like sitting there watching on TV, I'd rather go outside and play. You know, I love, I love playing any sport, uh, mm -hmm. but I can't stand sitting there and watching it on the TV. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I would say the stuff that I really enjoy doing is surfing Okay. Mountain biking, jet skiing, water skiing, snow skiing. Um, 
play a little bit of tennis, a little pickleball uh, for fun. Um, but man, like we used to have flag football games, like a bunch of the guys around here. Uh, so I'll, I'll, you know, I'll play anything. I love, I love sports. So I'm kind of down for whatever. But those would be kind of the, the bigger ones that I enjoy. Brilliant. I'll just call that the end of part one for a minute, David. Okay. Uh, I'll just pause that and then we'll come back to part two. Right. Back here with part two. David Pingree here. Uh, right. Next question I've got for you. What, what was your most memorable race or meeting that you've enjoyed the most? And why does it stick in your memory even to this day? Um, probably my last Supercross win, which was Anaheim 2, 2002, like I mentioned. Uh, and the thing that made it really special, one, it was my last race, you know, and, and even up on the podium, I was so late in my career at that point. I remember just like looking out at the stadium and go, you know, after I got my trophy and we popped the champagne and the interviews and all that, I remember just staying up there for a minute and going, just take it in, man. Yeah. this might be the last time you're ever up here you know you never know <laughs> yeah, yeah. and gosh i think it might have been i don't know if i got another podium that year because i got hurt yeah. anyway um but that race if you remember if you go back on youtube and watch yeah um james stewart was just ridiculously fast you know that was his rookie season and he was doing things that no one had ever done before yeah. and he slid out in the first turn and i think i was third or fourth or fifth or something and i actually went up into second and then I made a mistake and went back to fifth and then just kind of slowly started chipping my way through and got to the lead, pulled out a little bit of a lead. And then, you know, for me, I'm just thinking, okay, just hit, you know, hit your marks, do your laps, yeah. no mistakes. And I start hearing the crowd get really loud. And I'm like, Oh man, you know this gonna... sucker's coming. What's going on? <laughs> so there was a spot where there was a 180 degree turn and then a triple. And so I could look over real easy and see the lane coming at me. And I, okay. and I saw him move into third. That's what the big crowd was, you know, roar was for. Oh, yeah. And I'm going, okay, I still got, you know, I'm like kind of tracing back the track. I'm like, he's, I've still got a pretty good gap on him. And so I'm just doing my laps. And then I hear another big roar and I'm like, <laughs> and so, you know, I, I think there was maybe three laps to go and the crowd's just now just yelling the whole, it's just like a roar. And I'm going, what? what's going on, man? Is he like, is he close to me? Like what's happening? He's just, he was just hanging it out. He was like on the edge of crashing everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Set lap times, I think faster than the 250 class at that point. And um, anyway, I hit the triple on look and he's, oh, gosh, I don't know, maybe seven seconds, six, seven seconds back. And I'm like, okay, if I keep going this pace, he's going to catch me. You know, like it's going to be, he's going to be all over me on this last lap. Yeah. And if he gets to me, he's probably going to get me. He's got all this momentum coming. So I said, okay, I got to go faster. And that's really hard to do. Uh, to, pumped, when situation. you've done all these laps and you're just into a rhythm and then you go, okay, you have to be two seconds a lap faster right now. Yeah. So I started just like carrying a little more speed into the whoops and like pushing the turns a little harder. And there was this section where, he landed off a triple and jumped into the sand pit and I just started sending it. I was jumping like all the way into this thing and probably like, I, I didn't even know what was going to happen. I'm like, I just got to go faster. And I just jumped in and it worked out perfectly. And I was like, Whoa, that was really fast, you know? And so for those last two laps, I held him. I mean, he barely even caught me. Oh, I don't know that I could have done that pace for 15 laps, yeah. but I held him off and won with like even a little gap. And I was just like, it was a cool feeling. Um, just because I was able to stop his charge and, you know, be in my last race win. It was pretty fun. That's pretty awesome because normally if you try to do that, if you try to speed up again, like you said, and you tend to, like, maybe tense up, get arm pump. Yeah. Dead yeah. yeah, yeah, you'll either pump up or you just mm. – you'll start making mistakes trying to yeah, go faster. Yeah, yeah. It's really yeah. tough to just up your speed, and That's I was able to do cool. it. Was, That's pretty cool. It's pretty, cool. pretty special. Right. Um, who are your best mates during your racing career? And do you still keep in contact with them? <clears throat> well, um, yeah, actually I do. So early on, I would say Chad Pedersen, if you remember that name. He was a, a really fast kid. You know, he was a little bit older than I was, but we lived right across the street from each other. He was my teammate at Pro Circuit in 90, 96, I think 96. 
uh, and 97, I want to say, or maybe 96 only. And then he went to Chaparral Yamaha, but, uh, we were, we still keep in touch, you know, um, we were good buddies. Uh, when Grant came over, um, Langston, he and I were good friends. He, he and I and Brock Sellers got to be really good buddies. And uh, I haven't seen Brock in a couple of years. Like, he lives kind of out in the middle of nowhere in, the, in Ohio. So it, he keeps a low profile. But um, obviously, Grant and I are still buds. Uh, I was at his birthday party ride day today. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, he's the co-host of the Whiskey Throttle Show. So he and I are obviously good. Yeah. Um, Casey Johnson was another buddy of mine. Yeah. And uh, I don't see him too much. He's kind of had some hard times, a couple of divorces and just some bad, you know, some bad choices here and there. But uh, when I do see him, we're, we're friendly. Um, so, you know, all those guys. And then Phil Lawrence, who was a friend of mine as well, he actually ended up marrying my wife's sister. Oh, so now God. Factory Phil Lawrence is my brother-in-law. Just about to say Factory <laughs> Phil. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, there's not a ton of them that I really stay in close contact with because, you know, life happens. You all kind of go your separate ways. You have kids and life just gets yeah. busy, yeah. Uh, especially because I, I don't work in the industry completely anymore. You know, I, I got out and went into the fire service. But when we see each other and we'll bump into each other at Anaheim or, you know, at some function around here. And we're all still like we just fall right back into being friends and hanging out. But um yeah, I don't. A lot of them I don't really keep in touch with, date on a day to day basis anymore. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, what do you miss the most about your racing days? Um, <clears throat> I miss the big checks when I would do well. That was real nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's real easy to pay off a credit card or yeah. fix something around your house that's broken when you get a ten, fifteen thousand dollar check that shows up. Was it always uh, like a lot of bonus related? Was it and stuff like that? Or? Yeah, for me it was it was bonus. I mean, you know, back in my day, I think I was making seventy five grand as a salary. Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe by the time I had goggles and boots and stuff, I was at a hundred grand. But it was the bonuses, you know, and they weren't as good back then. But still, I think a win was thirty grand. Oh, yeah. Um, second was maybe fifteen or twenty or something, and then ten for third. So, I mean, a $10,000 check shows up to your house. Uh, I don't know about you. That's, that's a big yeah. deal now. I'd be that's, really stoked to have that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I do miss that. But I, I miss I miss being on that podium and yeah. having all that work that you did and all the injuries and shit you went through to get there. Yeah. It, in that moment, it's worth it. You know what I mean? Yeah. You spend so much time preparing and and. And our sport's tough that way where there's only one week, one winner. You know, it's not like a team sport where the whole team wins and we won this many games. It's like yeah. there's one winner every weekend. And so especially when you come as, as an amateur kid, like all of the good pros were good amateurs, right? Yeah. And they probably won a lot. Yeah. They won locally. They would go to amateur nationals and win in their region. And so when you move to the pro class – the winning stops, you know, it, it yeah, slows yeah. way, way down yeah, yeah. because usually you have a guy like McGrath or a guy like Emick or a guy like Carmichael and they just do all the winning. You know, there's only a few guys that get on a roll and they get, they figure the formula out and they're, they're still winning everything. Yeah. And for the rest of us, you know, you, it's just a mental battle. And if, you know, trying to deal through injuries, it's a physical battle and you're just trying to get back to that top step. So to get a win, like ah this is what i you know this is what it feels like to win again i forgot you know um yeah it's it's an incredible feeling uh and in that era so so stacked as well in that era it was so stacked as well yeah it still is man i mean there there's not a lot of seasons that are easy uh, to win races there's always at least a few really fast people Mm. you know right now to try to beat Kenny and Cooper and Eli. Good luck. Yeah. Yeah, or, yeah. you know, uh, Forkner and Ferrandis and, you know, I mean, uh, they're so just they're ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Right. Um, do you have any regrets from your racing days? Was there any uh, race days you feel you should have won or done better that got away from you or even riding a certain bike for a season that you wish you hadn't of? 
Um, <clears throat> I think I took the best opportunities uh, year to year that I that I could. So I don't have any regrets as far as the teams I went to. I wish that I would have sought out um, somebody kind of like Carmichael did. You know, he went to Johnny O. And they had a connection through Oakley because Johnny was working at Oakley at the time. Yeah, yeah. But he said, hey, can you just help me just, so just like steer Heiser. me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And while Johnny wasn't, you know, um, the end all be all, he doesn't have a, a, a degree in sports nutrition or sports physiology. Yeah. He'd been there and done that. And he knew the amount of work it took to be successful. And as a kid, you got to remember everyone back when you're getting started, you're a teenager. And we're all idiots when we're teenagers. Like, just that's the reality of it. We think yeah. we know everything, we know nothing. Yeah. And so I thought, well, no, I mean, I know I can see what Rhino's doing, and I, I, I know, I know how to ride motos. Like, I'm fine. Mm. I wish I would have found somebody, even Wardy. I could have gone to Wardy or RJ. You know, they were done with their careers. I bet for very little money, for a bonus only deal, mm. they would have been stoked to work with some young kid and try to help him come up. Yeah. Um, but I just. I just didn't. And so then you learn the lessons the hard way and, and the window of opportunity in this sport is so small yeah. that between getting hurt and just, you know, having things not quite break one way or the other, I never kind of built that momentum and, and kind of went to the next level. I was, you know, every year it was like, okay, I'm going to win this Supercross championship, put in a solid season outdoors, then I'll, I'll sign a contract to ride one more year, 125s. And then get a 250 factory ride. Like that was always the plan. Mm. And one one way, you know, again, like I said, there's only one champion every year. And I'm racing against Damon Huffman, Kevin Windham, Ricky Carmichael, David Villeman. I mean, <laughs> I I'd, sometimes I go back and be pissed. I'm like, I can't be pissed. Those guys are legends. Like, yeah. wasn't like I was getting beat by clowns, you know, guys <laughs> that were really, really good yeah. just beating me in the championship overall. So if I could go back and do it over, I would have tried to find somebody to help give mm. me the, the knowledge on training, mm. on nutrition. I ate like shit. I was a worst <laughs> eater. I did not eat well. I didn't know what, what was good or what was bad, you know? Uh, yeah. Even back then, it's changed. It was low fat. And then now it's low carb. And, that, you know, you know what I mean? I wish I had somebody that had an education that could have just helped me steer me on that side of things and find someone to help me with the racing side of it. Um, a little bit better because I kind of took it took me too long to figure it out and I had wasted some opportunities by then. So yeah, see what you're saying. It would have been cool to have a mentor of some sort. Yeah. I agree with that. Um next one. Can you tell us a funny story from your racing day memories? Oh geez, funny story. Um well I the first one that pops into my mind. Go on. Uh I told you I did some East Coast races on a 250 yeah. when I rode for Pro Circuit. So it was 95, my first year with Mitch, and I was riding the 250 East Coast. We raced Indianapolis. And I made the main. I want to. I got like maybe 15th or 6th. I didn't do that great. Um, it was the first 250 Supercross I'd ever done. So yeah. I was stoked to just get in the main and yeah, yeah. check it out. Um, and we went – we all went – the whole industry was – there was – Right next to the stadium, there's a grouping of hotels that all of us were staying at. And there was a there was a restaurant. I can't remember the name of what it was. TGI Fridays or some some restaurant. And everyone was there after the race. It was packed. DeCoster, all of Team Suzuki. Uh, I mean, you name it. Pond of Troy guys were all in there. And uh, I was going with Mitch. And as we get there, Troy Lee comes pulling in. And he's with Johnny O, uh, funny enough. And Troy's wasted drunk. He's so drunk. He gets out of the car. And I'm pretty new to, you know, like I'm still kind of, a, I'm a kid. I'm 17, 18 at this point. And, uh, you know, still pretty new to the circuit and just <laughs> didn't, I, this, I'm, I'm pretty green. Anyway, yeah, and Troy yeah. comes, he's all loud and he goes wandering around the side of the building. And there was a glass atrium that, you know, you could sit inside this glass atrium. So it was like sunlight in the day or whatever. And, Nice little spot to sit, but protected from the cold of outside. Well, Troy goes walking up, and DeCoster's sitting in the atrium eating. So it's a glass wall. Troy's knocking on the window. Hey, Roger. And he starts peeing on the glass. He's oh wasted drunk. 
And so we're laughing. We're like, oh, my gosh, look at him, you know. And he comes walking in, and there was a huge, uh, like, these moose antlers up on the wall. Okay. And he goes, oh, I want that for my for my showroom. And he jumps up off the ground, and he's got the antlers in it. He's hanging from them. And he's, like, shaking, trying to yank them off the wall. They're bolted in, so they're not coming off. We're like, Troy, get down. Oh, my gosh, you know, you're going to get in trouble. And then he... <laughs> He wanders over to a table and they have the lights that come down on a chain and the, the, the electrical cables wound through the chain. He starts spinning the lights. And I don't know why he thought that was fun, but he's spinning the light. And there's some people eating at this table. They're like looking at him going, what are you doing? You know, he's just spinning. And the chain kinked up and wound up enough that it, it severed the cord and sparks shot out of this thing and the light goes out. And so he thought that was great. He starts doing it to another table. You know, we're like, no, Troy. <laughs> so at this point the manager finally comes over and is like you know your your friend's too drunk he's got to go yeah. and johnny was like yeah yeah okay we're, we'll get him out of here you know and they, he starts getting him to the door well there's one of those huge gumball machines i mean it's five feet tall this huge gumball machine <laughs> i was like i'm taking that and he starts waddle like wheeling it out the door you know like shimming it side to side getting it out the front door he gets it out the door johnny had run to get the car so he pulls the car up to the front when he by the time he gets there Troy's got the gumball machine right to the door. He's like, help me get this in. And the manager's standing right behind him. Excuse me, sir. You can't take that. <laughs> so we Madness, shoved Troy Madness. in the car. And, and anyway, I was just like, holy cow. Yeah. This is a weird industry, man. What, what goes on here? Yeah, what's happening? <laughs> but there's a lot of stories with Troy, Lee, and Mitch Payton that kind of have that same tone. Those guys <laughs> go hard when they go. <laughs> right, right, right. They definitely let their air down then. Uh, right, the next one I've got. Uh, tell us uh, what you personally felt that you were known for in your style of racing riding, if you could use three words to sum up your full riding ways and style. Um, my riding style, I would say uh, smooth, technical, and corner speed uh those were kind of the three my three best attributes like the more technical a track was the better i did uh and especially in my younger years before my knees got really screwed up my corner speed was kind of my biggest strength um you know sometimes i'd struggle with whoops because my legs are short but as far as like technical rhythm sections or jumps or yeah i was just good at that if it was really fast and just wide open and hang on for dear life and close your eyes, that wasn't really my style. Mm. Uh, but the more technical throttle control, yeah. you know, a jump or a rhythm or something where it was really tough to time it, mm. that was kind of my strength. Mm. That's cool. And smooth is always good. Yeah. <laughs> um, the next one I've got is what were you, your strengths you feel and possible weaknesses you felt you had in your racing days? touched on that a little bit yeah i mean the strengths like i the things i just mentioned i would say um my starts i was a good starter yeah by and large that helped me um i was always much better in a race than i was like a time qualifying yeah. or if you were just someone was there doing laps lap times i i wasn't that great you know and i, I was really glad that we until i retired we, we still did qualifying races we didn't do qualifying by lap times like they do now yeah, yeah. And I'm really glad for that because I, I would have had to either learn how to go fast for one lap or I would have been doing terrible. Mm. Um, my weakness, and I've said this a lot, is it was mud. Uh, you know, having spent the bulk of my amateur career in Arizona, if you know anything about that area, it's a desert. There is no mud, so you know, especially not like slimy, slick mud, right? So, yeah, yeah. And, and another mistake I made, I, I tell this to young riders all the time. If you go to a practice track or, or if it's raining out, go ride. Yeah. Don't say, well, I'll wait, I'll wait till the track's good or, you know, yeah. when, th when they water, I'll wait till I'll let some guys clear the mud off and then I'll go out. Go ride. Yeah. Because, uh, and I imagine at GP, I mean, the guys coming from the GPs are great mud riders. Um, and over here, the way it's gone, you know, we always have a couple muddy supercrosses because we go to a lot of stadiums with open roofs. And at the Nationals, they flood it in the morning like they always have. I mean, it is a swamp, and you got to do fast laps in that. 
your qualifying times based on those two practices. So you have to go fast in the sloppy mud. Uh, we get rain races, so you know it's going to be muddy at those. And because they prep them so deep to try to keep the dust down for the whole day, the tracks end up very rutted. And even though it's not mud, it's it's ruddy, sticky. I mean, the ruts and the turns are shoulder deep, man. I mean, your leg gets buried in there. Mm-hmm. So it's it's like a mud mud track that's sort of come around, right? Mm-hmm. And I just never was really great in those conditions. So that hurt me in my in my national performances. You know, I, I had a lot of top tens, a handful of podiums. I never won a national, which is a bummer, you know. Um, but it was it was because. All of my good results, I could go back and look through them and like clockwork. If the if the track conditions were good, I did good. You did good. Right? Like uh, I, in 98, I was on an FMF Honda, slowest bike in the world. This thing was like, you could get <laughs> off next to it and run faster than this thing would go. <laughs> but it was a, the opening round was at Glen Helen that year. It had rained all week and it was cloudy and overcast. So the dirt was perfect. I mean, perfect traction. And I got third, you know, uh, ran up front the whole weekend. I think I went two, four or something like that for third overall. If I remember right, it's been a long time, but I did great. And the team was shocked, you know, like it was the first outdoor podium for that team because that was their first year. And um, I beat Scott Sheik and Sellards and all the other teammates I had that were expected to do really well. Uh, And then I I was out the rest of that season with a knee injury. But um, I had years where I was on much better equipment. And you can watch and go, oh, yeah, this was a mud race or that track's hard pack, like Sacramento, like I mentioned. Yeah. Never yeah. did good there. Never. <laughs> because they pour water on it before the race. So the first half of the race, I'm tiptoeing around trying not to crash. And by the time the track comes around, the race is halfway over. The leaders are gone, you know. I might yeah. come back to 10th, but yeah. um, it was that was my – for sure my biggest weakness. Okay, cool. Um, if you could re-race a meeting or a race tomorrow in your full prime, where and what would it be? Why? San Diego Supercross, 1996. Very certain of that. Yep. Uh, so that was um, in 95 was my first year with Mitch, and I won one race, got a couple podiums, but I was still kind of finding my footing. And um, going into that, 96 season i just got really focused i went over to bercy and won all three nights in paris i did all the testing on the race bike so it was basically built for me and the year before i was riding kind of what rhino had built and his he likes to just hold it wide open and clutch it and that didn't work for me so i i built the bike around me man i was fit i was so hungry you know and went to the opening round which was an east and west round and did pretty well Came to Anaheim, hole shot it, got taken out by Greg Schnell, which is the reason I don't like Greg Schnell. Uh, <laughs> had a really rough night there, second in Seattle. I was second in points to Wyndham, but he had maybe 10 points on me or something, 12. And he was better. Oh, I mean, I'm just straight up. He was amazing that year, and he was better. Well, Tuesday of that week before San Diego, I get a call. Hey, Kevin Wyndham crashed. He broke his collarbone. He's not racing this weekend. And after, um, after San Diego, there was a break and then two rounds left to run. So I knew he'd be back for those two rounds. So I thought, okay, if I can win in San Diego this, this weekend, yeah. then if I, I don't remember the exact math, but if I would have won, sorry, I got a blower going out there. Can you hear that? <laughs> Give me a minute. Anyway, I thought, okay, if I go to this weekend and win, I could finish second and third at the last two rounds and still win the championship. Yeah. And I was easily the second fastest guy. I think Jamie Dobb was over here at that time. Jeff Willow, um, who ended up winning San Diego. Casey Johnson. Uh, anyway, so I go into San Diego. I'm focused. I know what I got to do. And in practice, is that really loud? It's not too bad. It's not too okay. bad. Yeah. So in practice, I'm like, okay, I'm going to throw in some really fast laps here, kind of make a statement. Well, I come up behind Pedro Gonzalez. I don't know if you remember Pedro. Yeah, yeah I remember. Yeah. And there was this double out of a turn, and then a, it was a rhythm section, but you could triple. 
And so he doubles and he, I hear him get on the gas like he's going to triple. So I'm right behind him. I commit to doing it and he checks up and just doubles. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm already like, I'm at the base of the jump and I'm, I'm already in it. Yeah. So I kind of just go, I lift to the right a little bit. Well, I just kept drifting to the right and I landed on a hay bale. Just ate shit. I was a mess laid out all over the start straight, broke my femur, broke my hand, blew out an ACL on my left knee. I mean, it was a big one and it took, it ruined my whole season and took me a lot of 97 to get, to get kind of mentally back in it. But if I could have that race over and just be patient, like, oh, why couldn't I have just been patient? Because I was 19 or 20 and full of piss and vinegar. But <laughs> if I could have just been patient, like I said, Jeff Willow ended up winning that that race. It was the only race he ever won. And not 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 taking anything away from Jeff, but like I, I feel like I could have won that race and won that championship, and that could have completely changed the trajectory of my career. But. Like Gio likes to say, if my aunt had balls, she'd be my uncle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that. Right, is that all right if I just call that the end of part two for a second? Yeah. Uh, right, we're back up and running. I'm here with David Pingree. Uh, continue on with the questions. Uh, what do you feel was your best achievement in motocross, stroke supercross, and why? <sighs> best achievement? Um, I mean, it has to be, I won four supercross races. So I think that that, if I'm looking at my whole career, I'm, I'm proud of that. Yeah. There's not a lot of guys who won four races or more Yeah. who didn't win a championship or go on to do really big things. So, I mean, it's a, it's a, um, it's rare to do, uh, yeah. you know, I got an X games medal for supermoto, which I thought was really cool. That was yeah. really fun. Yeah. Cool, yeah. uh, won the Prince of Bercy in 95. I, I, that's a, that meant a lot to me. Yeah. What do you think of that race? That was quite cool. I, I always, I loved it at Bercy Stadium. Um, I haven't been since they've been to the new place. And I know it's bigger and um, probably a much better track, but I don't know. There was something cool and intimate about that old Bercy Stadium, you know. Yeah. We loved it in Europe, watching that on the TV on Eurosport, I think it was. Yeah. What did you think about the whole, I loved the tunnel bit. The straight in the tunnel. Yeah, I mean, it, it was sketchy as hell, to be really was honest. It, was it, was I, it? One year, I, I got a little squirrely and hit a cement pillar oh, and hurt my geez. shoulder and had to had to pull out of the race. I think it was 97, maybe. Yeah. Um, but uh, it was it was just unique, you know? Yeah. And uh, yeah. there was such a cool history there going back to the 80s. And um, that, that was part of what made it so neat. It was just cool, all the Americans going over there, and it was just really cool. Yeah, they did a good job with presentation, you know. Mm, yeah. Um, was I fantastic. remember Ricky, maybe was it one year they had like Rick Johnson and Jeff come out in a, like a spaceship or something. Do you remember that? I mean, yeah, they yeah, just they did, did quite really a few cool things stuff. Like yeah. And one year they had like this big metal hand and maybe JMB came down on that or something. They just did it. They really went all out with the, the yeah. show. And uh, at the time, no even the supercrosses here in the U S they weren't even nearly as, as much pageantry as what he did, you know? So that was a cool event. Yeah. Very cool. Um, who were the riders you always used to have run run-ins with and didn't particularly enjoy racing with and why? Well, Schnell, like I mentioned for sure. Yeah. yeah. He just pissed me off cause he not, not and looking back on it, what he did, I would have probably done the same thing. It just ruined my night, so I was pissed yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, other riders, who else did I have run-ins with? That's a tough one, man. I mean, like I said, every year was a little different. There was never somebody, there was never one guy that I was just always hitting, you know, <laughs> running into or having issues with. It kind of changed, you know, because I, I mean, I spanned over 10 years. So obviously, guys come and go through that time. So that's kind of a tough one to answer. I don't, I don't really it, have a good was answer. It, was, there any, was there any guys that you sort of uh, remember thinking when you needed to know that they were around type of thing? Like they'd probably try and take you out or not really? Or was everyone just out for themselves? Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think of who. Who was tough that way? 
I'd have to go back and look through some old names. Mm. It's hard for me to pull up off the top of my head. Um, there definitely was guys that I didn't like to race. Um, you know, guys that would rev their bike a lot or yell at you. Like, I would hate to race against Barsha. That kind of stuff God, just, uh, just drives me nuts, you know. Um, but I can't pull up any name of anybody. In you see, that Barsha seems to have something going on with Tomac at the moment. Don't they? they keep getting into... Yeah, they keep getting into each other, yeah. That's weird, isn't it? <laughs> All right, cool. Um, if you could give some advice to any amateur rider um, that wants to go pro, what would it be? Well, uh, the best advice I can give, kind of like, you know, learn from people that have gone before you. So uh, I would say seek out advice from the best of your era, right? So go talk to Stefan over there. Or if you're here, talk to old pros. Yeah. Listen to these podcasts, you know, like, you know, and, and learn from their mistakes. Like I've said, I wish I would have found a, a better nutritionalist. I wish I would have had an old pro racer kind of steer me in the right direction with a program. How much should I be riding? How many times a week? What specifically should I work on? Um, all those kinds of things. Uh, there's so much to it, but I would try to find people that have been there and done that yeah. and get their advice. And, and there's a very different, th- you know, there's a big difference between a riding coach and a trainer mm-hmm. and they're, they're two completely separate things they need to work together but i would say really look at that and um you know kind of things i've mentioned don't avoid conditions because you don't like them mm-hmm. get out and ride in the mud you know look at how bad ricky sucked in the mud mm-hmm. if you watch mount morris 297 mm-hmm. he went in with like a 30 some point lead crashed his it was a mudder crashed mm-hmm. his brains out three, four, five, six times each moto and left with like a five point lead. Mm. And he still won the championship. But my point is he went on. Then if you look back to Oh five, Oh five, Oh six at Millville, he lapped the entire field in that mud race. So Ricky mm-hmm. took his, he took his weakness and he turned it into a strength mm. to where he was amazing at it. Right. Uh, Fox Hills. I think he got his ass yeah. kicked pretty good over there. Uh, in the mud right so he learned learned those lessons and he turned that into a string yeah that's 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 pretty cool when the top guys do that um i've got questions a few more uh who were the best three riders you ever raced with and why jeremy jeremy for sure ricky for sure um And uh, I don't want to get the wrong guy here. I mean, those two are 100% for sure. I mean, I want to say Wyndham for me. Wyndham was so good. He was so talented. It was frustrating. It was really frustrating. Yeah, James, too. I, I guess James probably... I only raced him what one year though, because the next year he went to the other coast, and then he moved up. So I didn't get to. I didn't race with him a ton outdoors. I never even saw the guy. He was so <laughs> far out in front of me. Wyndham, I actually had some races with, but those guys, you know, they were just they were so good. They would just you, they had you beat mentally before you even went to the gate. Yeah. You know, and I, I tell people this all the time, like. I, I remember my rookie year, I got done with the Supercross main event, and I'm, I'm watching the 250 guys come down the tunnel. And Jeremy comes down, and he's got this look in his eyes like he's just looking through everybody. Mm-hmm. I, I've never seen like this focus. It was just crazy. I went, oh, my gosh, look at that guy. <laughs> no, one has, no one has a chance. He's going to kill him. Yeah. And he did. You know, I mean, he was just so good. He was good on the bike, but he was so good mentally. All those guys were. Um, it was just that after a while, you just sort of accepted that you weren't going to beat them. Yeah. It's almost like you could see that they believed that they were the best as well. Yeah, and that that's Fair. everything. That's yeah. everything, right? I mean, mm, in, our, in this sport, at that level, everybody's really good riders. Mm. Technically, they're very close. You know, guys will have strengths and weaknesses, but it comes down to right here. And the guys that can get this all screwed in and working right, those are the guys that have 10 world titles and 
seven Supercross titles, you know. The whole package. Yep. yep. Uh, all right, just got a couple more. Um, you become a team manager too for Troy Lee Design Honda. Mm-hmm. How did that come about, and did you enjoy it? And what does that ent- what did that entail? <clears throat> so, um, when I quit racing, I started working for a magazine over here, yeah. and I was doing that for a while, and that was a really nice transition for me because I still went and did some international races, and I'd write road trip stories about it. I was testing bikes, and it was a real nice step out of the sport for me. Um, somehow I got in, a buddy of mine was doing some supermoto. Supermoto was really picking up momentum over here. So I did one, um, and, and really liked it. So then the next year I did a few more and I actually won a race. So then the following year, Troy hired me because the Troy Lee Designs Red Bull Honda team was one of the premier teams over here. So he hired me to ride the 250. I won, I think six rounds that year, uh, had a big lead in the championship till I broke my arm, uh, which bumped me down to second in the standings overall um did i think i did two or three years with them doing that and then they were trying to transition out of supermoto into supercross and i was talking to troy about he goes yeah man he goes i just need somebody that knows how supercross works and like how things should be run and i need someone in here like that and um i said well yeah I'll, i'll do it you know like and he goes, really? And we started talking and it just worked out. Um, and it was, it was a lot of basics, you know, they, the way, like I mentioned, the way the truck was set up, yeah. um, the riders that they had were very young at the time because they had a small budget. So just helping them build a good routine and, you know, some general outlines and parameters for what they need to do. Um, we had a great engine builder, a guy named Matt Jory, um, and we actually, you know, in the two years that I was there, yeah. uh, the year before I came, they were struggling to make mains. The year I came there, we had Jake Moss, Jimmy Albertson, Sean Borkenhagen, and Chris Blose. We had guys in the main every single weekend. We had certain rounds where we had four guys inside the top ten. Um, and then Jake Outdoors and Chris, both the road 450, had a couple outdoor events. They did really well. Then the following year, we had Will Hahn. And Cole Seeley, and then we brought over Ben Townley to race the Nationals on the 450. Yeah. And Cole and Will were on the podium every weekend. They were 2-3 at a couple rounds. Ben was uh, on the podium in the 450 class outdoors. He damn near won Redbud that year. Yeah. So on a budget that was about $800,000, $850,000 all in, yeah. we were competing with these factory teams that had multi-million dollar budgets, you know. So that was really fun to me. Going to the races on the weekends and and being at the race, that was fun to me. Sitting in my cubicle during the week and working out Excel spreadsheets and right typing up contracts and making phone calls to sponsors. I hated that stuff, man. I hated it. That was not for me. I learned right away, like, okay, desk jobs aren't for me. And then my wife and I had kids and uh I was gone so much, you know, I'm gone every weekend. I'd take Sunday afternoon off when I got home from the race and then I'm back at the shop Monday. Like she never saw me. The kids yeah. were in bed by the time I got home and I'm gone before they're up. And so we just said, or I said, this isn't, this isn't something I can do long-term, you know? So that was the downside. Uh, but I, I did enjoy being at the races. It's the next best thing to being on the line, you know, being up in that manager's tower, just, you got so much adrenaline going through you. Mm-hmm. And when the guys do well and the whole team is stoked, that's so fun. Yeah. It's pretty cool experience, then. Yeah, it was a neat experience. Learned a lot. What uh, riders do you enjoy watching ride now, race? Um, Kenny. I really like watching Kenny and Eli ride. Um, Kenny's so technically good on the bike. I've, I've been really enjoyed watching him. He's, he's kind of changing styles again where – where riders are seeing him just keeping their feet on the pegs a lot more through corners. He'll go through a rut even, and just he'll never take his foot off the pegs. He'll sit, but his feet stay on the pegs. Um, and Eli's just such an animal, you know, to watch him go through the pack like he has, like he did at the Supercross last week, and it's just incredible. Yeah. Um, and then the, the other one guy that I'm really, I really enjoy watching ride is Jet Lawrence. Um, 
I know it's it didn't end well, but that one race at Anaheim earlier this year, yeah. it just showed that that kid wants it so badly. You know what I mean? I, I that spoke volumes to me. And if this nothing's ever a sure thing in this sport, but like if I was gonna bank money on a kid, yeah. that's my guy. Back in. I think he's he's got the talent. He wants it. He's got Johnny O helping him. So, I mean, I feel like all the pieces are in place. He's got on a great team. I mean, so we'll see what happens. That's pretty cool. Um, I'm just going to finish up with uh, what were your, what are your social media usernames so that people can follow you on various platforms? Um, yeah, it's just at David Pingree 101 uh, on Instagram. Yeah. And then uh, I have a Twitter account, but I, I don't even – I mean, I think it's the same. It's at David Pingree 101. Um, but what I'd really rather people do is follow the Whiskey Throttle show. Uh, just about to say any shout outs. Just about to say any shout outs. Any shout outs. I was just about to say that. Yeah, that's been sort of my last project that I really like doing. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I feel like that there was something missing in this sport where, um, you know, the the heroes that have sort of come before us, there wasn't a good digital catalog of their careers and their lives. Yeah. And so our interviews are, man, it's a deep dive. It's, it's four hours, but you're going to know everything from the very beginning to what they're doing now. Yeah. And, you know, like, uh, I'll give you a great example. We had Marty Smith on last year. And so now to have that, now that Marty's passed away, it's like, oh, thank God we got him on. Yeah. So that people that don't know him, they can go back and watch that and see what an amazing guy he was. You know what I mean? And know what he did and why he was so good. and um. I feel like this is something that it's almost like a service to the sport, you know? So uh, we've had a lot of fun with that at whiskey throttle show. If you're looking for that on Instagram or uh, our Twitter is at W underscore throttle underscore show, which is a real shit show. You can just type search out whiskey throttle show. It should come up. Is that, but, uh, is that, on the, is that what's on your cap as well? Yeah. 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 yeah we got hats and t-shirts and all that stuff. So we've had a lot of fun doing that. That's really cool. Uh, David, really appreciate your time. Grateful. Yeah, mate. No, I appreciate you having me on. Best of luck with your show. And uh, when it comes out, let me know, and I'll, I'll boost it on my social media for you as well. That'd be awesome. I really appreciate it. Thanks ever so much for your time. Yeah, you betcha. Have a great night. Thank you. Top, right. top man. Thanks. You, Cheers, David. Bye.